Welcome to part two of subtopic 2.1. We're going to start off with this science understanding. Rates of reaction can be influenced by a number of factors, including the presence of inorganic and biological catalysts, what we call enzymes. You need to be able to predict and explain using collision theory the effects on rates of reaction due to changes in concentration, temperature, pressure for reactions involving gases, surface area and the presence of a catalyst. We're going to start off with what we mean by collision theory. This is what we can use to help explain reaction rates. So to do so we're going to consider this general reaction of A2 reacting with B2 to produce two lots of AB. In order for this reaction to occur we know that the particles must collide. So this diagram shows you how the reactants may collide. And we talk about there being uh, possibly successful or unsuccessful collisions. In this diagram, it's referred to as fruitful and unfruitful. So a fruitful collision involves a case where reactants A and B are colliding in the correct orientation. If they do so, this allows for the formation eventually of your products AB. An unsuccessful or unfruitful collision, we can see the reactants A2 and B2 have a different orientation, so they're colliding kind of side-on now. But this side-on collision isn't the correct orientation, so we just get a, a rebounding of uh, reactants A2 and B2. This diagram here shows you just another example, but with some additional information. So we're looking at the reaction of CO with NO2 to produce CO2 and NO. For the first scenario, we can see that it's got the incorrect orientation to allow for the formation of products. For part B, again, we've still got an incorrect orientation, so this collision won't actually be successful. Part C, on the other hand, we can see now the oxygens and the uh, carbon monoxide are in the correct orientation to then allow for this formation of an activated complex. This is kind of like the bridging point between the reactants and products. And as a result, it then allows for the formation of products. So that's all about the uh, having the correct orientation. But one thing we haven't factored in is you could get reactants colliding in the correct orientation, but they may not actually form products if they don't have enough energy to allow for those collisions. And that amount of energy which we require is what we call our activation energy. So as a summary, particles must collide with sufficient energy and in the correct orientation. Our activation energy, again, is the minimum energy required for reactants to collide and form products. We can observe activation energy in a number of ways. We can observe it from an energy profile diagram as well as an energy distribution graph. So the energy distribution graph is shown here. And this represents the uh, distribution of particles with various energies. So if we've got a particular reactant, it works out that only a certain proportion of reactants have the necessary energy, that is the activation energy, required for them to collide successfully and form products we still have a range of particles which don't have that sufficient energy. And we could work out how much by measuring the area underneath this green curve here. The proportion of reactants that have sufficient energy would be reflected by measuring the area underneath this part of the curve. So factors that affect the rate of a reaction include concentration of reactants, temperature, pressure when it's for reactions involving gases, surface area and catalysts. I've got one more point just to note and that's reactions that involve ions and solutions generally just occur fast so they're not really going to be affected by these factors. Examples include things like precipitation reactions and acid-base neutralizations. For our first factor we're going to consider this experiment here. We've essentially got two containers of hydrochloric acid of the same volume, but we can see that they are different concentrations. The one on the left has a concentration of 6.00 molar, 
one on the right, 1.00 molar. We can think of reacting it with a particular substance like a metal. So acids reacting with metals, we know can produce a salt and hydrogen gas. We could look at uh, comparing the differences at particular time intervals. So at time one, we can see that there is a bit of difference in the amount of bubbling that's forming. So that's the formation of hydrogen gas. We can see that the beaker on the left with the high concentrated acid seems to be reacting more vigorously. If we wait a bit further, what we might be able to then tell is that the metal has actually started to react more so and there is less of it actually present at time two. Again, we can still see the formation of more bubbles. And finally, at time three, we may notice that eventually the amount of our metal in beaker one on the left has actually completely reacted and gone into solution, whereas the beaker on the right still has some metal remaining. What we could say is that if we were looking at increasing the concentration of our reactants, this is going to increase the rate of a reaction. But why does that actually occur? So this diagram helps summarize why. Over to the left, we have a container with a low concentration of reactants. This means that we're going to end up with not very many collisions, as well as not very many successful collisions we can say the rate of reaction is low. If we were to increase the concentration, and keep in mind this is the same volume or the same amount of space, but we've got now more moles or more molecules of reactants, this is going to allow for a greater frequency of collisions, and this is what's going to result in a higher rate of reaction. To summarize, increasing the concentration increases the number of moles of reactants in a given volume. This will not only just increase the frequency of collisions, which is the number of collisions that occur per unit of time, that could be per second per minute, but it also increases the frequency of successful collisions and that's really the key point there. And as a result, this will then increase the rate of reaction. This is the reason why if you place a glowing splint in air, that it's not going to ignite. But the moment you place it into pure oxygen, you can actually see the glowing splint uh, reignite and burst into flames. This is because we've got an increased concentration of oxygen, which is needed for combustion of our glowing splint. The second factor to consider is temperature. So here we've got our energy distribution graph again. So the original was in green here at temperature of T1. If we were to look at increasing the temperature, then what this will do is change the distribution of reactant particles with particular energies. And we can see that there is this shift towards the right, such that now, if you compare the area underneath both curves, at the higher temperature, we actually have a greater proportion of reactant particles with the required activation energy, or even it can exceed it. And so, because there's an increased proportion, we're going to expect an increase in the rate of reaction. So by increasing temperature, this increases the kinetic energy of the particles, and this will increase the proportion of particles with those higher energies. This increases the number of particles with that sufficient energy, that activation energy that's needed for reactants to collide and form products. There is a second fold effect, and that's that the increased kinetic energy results in increased movement and increased frequency of collisions, which is also going to increase the frequency of successful collisions. But the increased number of particles with sufficient energy has a much greater effect. And so both of these scenarios is going to then increase the rate of reaction. Our third factor we're going to consider is a change in pressure, and in particular, an increase in pressure. Over to the left side, we've got a fixed number of uh, gaseous molecules. We can see that they have space to move around and to essentially collide. Uh, maybe there's not a very high chance in this case. We can look at increasing the pressure. One way of doing that is by decreasing the volume. We haven't actually changed the number of moles or the number of molecules of our reactant, but by pushing it into a smaller volume, we've effectively increased its concentration.
And we know that by increasing concentration, we're going to increase the frequency of collisions and also increase the frequency of successful collisions, which is then going to increase the rate of reaction. So with pressure, remember that this only occurs for gases and gaseous systems. It's essentially the same effect as increasing the concentration because what we do is we increase pressure by decreasing volume and we can see that in the diagram on the right. So we've still got the same number of moles or number of molecules of reactants but by pushing them into a smaller volume we end up increasing the frequency of collisions and successful collisions and this is what's going to increase the rate of reaction. For our next factor, I'm going to get you to consider the process and the art of building a campfire. We can see in this campfire that you've got a range of branches and logs of different size. So if you were to have a large log and a bunch of branches and small twigs of the same mass, which one of the two would actually burn more rapidly? The answer would be obviously the bunches of small branches and twigs and that has to do with surface area that is exposed and allows it to react and to combust. Imagine that we put a strip of metal into a solution of acid. The acid effectively can only collide with the metal atoms on the surface of that strip. Those metal atoms in the centre of the strip are unable to collide and react with the hydrogen ions in our acid. If we were to then look at just breaking apart the strip into smaller components, this will actually increase the ability for the acid to collide and to successfully collide to then react with the metal and form its products. So what we've effectively done is we've increased the area in which magnesium or the metal can collide and react with the acid. We have effectively increased the surface area of the metal. Surface area could be also referred to as the uh, state of subdivision of particles. Smaller particles have a greater surface area than larger particles. If we increase the surface area, this increases the ability for collisions to occur. This will then increase the frequency of successful collisions. And then this will therefore increase the rate. So it always comes back to this increased frequency of successful collisions. For our last factor, this is on catalysts. The catalyst can be defined as a substance that speeds up chemical reactions by providing an alternate pathway of lower activation energy. Keep in mind that this doesn't actually lower the activation energy of the normal reaction, it just provides a different route or a different pathway for this to occur, which is of lower energy. Some examples of catalysts include using nickel in the hydrogenation of unsaturated compounds like triglycerides and converting them into saturated compounds. It also includes uh, platinum, which we can often use in catalytic converters. We can look at the effect of catalysts on an energy profile diagram. And on this, we can see that the energy of the reactants and products remains unchanged. The value of our enthalpy change of delta H remains unchanged. But it's the barrier that's required in order to convert reactants into products, that is the activation energy, that ends up changing. So without a catalyst in blue, we can see that there is this amount of energy required to convert reactants to products. With the addition of a catalyst, it's actually provided an alternate pathway, which has a lower activation energy. So this will then obviously increase the rate of the reaction. We can look at the effect of a catalyst on an energy distribution graph as well. So looking and comparing to our previous example where the activation energy was here and in green we can see the proportion of reactants with the required activation energy. By introducing a catalyst this effectively lowers the activation energy 
So we can see now that there is a greater proportion of reactant molecules with the required activation energy. So this is going to increase the rate of reaction. To help summarize this, we could say that catalysts allow for more particles to have sufficient energy to collide and to form their products. One other thing to keep in mind is that catalysts aren't actually used up in a reaction, so they're quite useful because they can be just reused. If we look in a biological sense, then catalysts are referred to as enzymes. We'd say that enzymes have a region called an active site, so this is the region where our reactant or our substrate binds into and when it binds it forms this so-called enzyme substrate complex. Essentially the enzyme acts to place stress on these uh, substrates or um, this substrate to allow for the conversion of it into products. So it can often uh, allow for a bit of stress to be placed on chemical bonds to help break them and to then form new products. If we were looking at combining reactants together to form products, then it could actually provide the correct orientation for them to uh, align and to collide and then to form products. As a final point, I'm just going to talk about inhibitors because sometimes reactions may actually proceed too quickly and need to be slowed down. So inhibitors are substance that can help slow down chemical reactions. And some chemical reactions that occur too quickly might generate too, too much heat, and that could be an unfavorable thing. Comparing them to enzymes, they usually are not recovered at the end of a reaction. Inhibitors can typically work in one of two ways. We have what we call competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. The competitive inhibitor, you can see, has a very similar shape to the substrate or to our reactant so that it can actually compete for the binding into the active, active site of the enzyme. And if it binds into the active site, it prevents the reactant or substrate from binding in and allowing for a reaction to occur. In our second scenario, our non-competitive inhibitor ends up binding to a site that's separate to the active site. This is what we call an allosteric site. And when it binds to this uh, allosteric site, it often causes changes to the shape of the active site so that the substrate is no longer able to bind to this new active site, which then affects the ability for the substrate to then be converted into its products. I'm going to finish up with a word of warning when it comes to rates of reaction. We looked at a number of ways in which we can increase the rate of a reaction. You have to keep in mind that increasing a rate of reaction does not actually increase the amount of the product that's formed or increase the amount of a reactant that gets used up in a reaction. So on this graph we can see two curves where we've got a faster and a slower rate of reaction. And what we can see is that both of these curves essentially approach the same location. They end up plateauing at the same point, or they technically should plateau at the same point, so that you end up perhaps forming the same amount of product in the end. It's just that initially, for the faster rate, that you form a much greater amount of product at the start of a reaction, but then it starts to slow down and then plateau later on. So again, just to summarize, we would say that both of these should converge to the same amount. That concludes the videos for subtopic 2.1. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.